Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Let me introduce our speaker tonight, and I'm honored to do so. You know, the word apostolic is a big word. It means an apostle. It means um, somebody who builds other churches and doesn't build on the foundation of other people but builds on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's someone who edifies and strengthens. Apostolic would be like the apostles of Peter and James and John as they went out and started churches. Paul, the apostle, was an, Paul is great, one of the great apostles of our, our life uh, that we can look back at and see as a tremendous man of God. In different generations, there are apostles. I'm not an apostle. I'm very proud, very happy just to be a pastor. I think just being a pastor is wonderful, and I'm excited about just having God allowing me the privilege of being a pastor. To be an apostle is amazing. I met Carl, I don't know how many years ago, when this church first got started. That's how long we've known each other. How many years? 25 years ago. We were both young kids then. And uh, he has been a man of God in Africa. He lives in Africa. He has probably 10,000 or more pastors that listen to him. They call him Papa. So when you hear him refer to Papa, that's what they call him. He goes all over the area of Africa, places truly I do not want to go to. I don't even want to have anything to do with it. That's just the way it is. I don't mind telling you. I don't want to eat that food. I don't want to sleep in that place. Let me out of here. I remember being in Tanzania. He invited me down to preach. Debbie and I and Pastor Luke went down to Tanzania. They had just blown up the American consulate. That was how many years ago? A number of years ago, 15 years ago, 12 years ago. They didn't like white people and they didn't like Americans. When I drove down the street, they would stop and crowd the car and beat on the car. We were driving back from preaching the gospel. People are beating on the car. I'm going, look, I don't want to be here any more than you don't want me to be here. Just let me out of this place. You know what I'm saying? And so I had a really bad attitude. Still have a bad attitude. Can you tell? And I want you to know the neat thing about it is there are people that don't have a bad attitude. People who love the people of these cities and these towns and these villages. A man that goes into a place like uh, uh, the Congo. You don't know this because you live in America. Congo's been under a civil war for years. Debbie was there a few years ago and she would be preaching the gospel, hearing the gunshots just across the way where it was going while she was preaching the gospel. Debbie is like Carl in a sense. She goes like all over the world to those places. I'm the only sissy that likes Southern California. The roughest I want to get is San Bernardino. (laughs) That's it, God. That's my limit. But this is a real, true man of God. He would not want to say this himself. So I'm saying it so you understand that this is a man worth standing for and giving God a great big thank you very much, God, for sending great men and women around the world. Carl Saunders, you come and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love you, buddy. 55 minutes. Thank you. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. I have 35 minutes. And I have a couple of hours uh, things to share with you, but we will try and do it within 35 minutes. I want to thank you for the honor for allowing me to stand here in this pulpit. I know Pastor Jim, Pastor Debbie, indeed 25 years. For 25 years, this church has been supporting us. And uh, that's why we still look good. Uh, Never mind if he points out out all the weaknesses of Africa. This year was 
two, two big things happened to us, to me and my wife, this year. First of all, we were 50 years married. And I want to be honest, we never spoke about divorce or never touched it, but murder. <laughs> and then we were 40 years uh, in the mission. Uh, we have been doing 40 years mission work, or working with pe other people. And um, this is where is our heart. And I still believe in Africa. I believe in Africa more as ever before. I even believe that Africa could make a very big difference, and Africa is going to make a big difference in this world. Totally, you can take that from me. It's going to. Things are happening. Because today I'm far more optimistic because we have a new generation, a new type of leader, the younger man who do not depend anymore on somebody else coming from Europe or depending on dollars or depending on, let's call it wife, white faces. You know, that, that's how we started mission work. And today we have younger men who have a more, more passion and zeal and understand what is God's plan and God's purposes for the church. For nearly, you could say nearly 30 years, I've believed in, that's what we believed in. Never mind the first years we did evangelism, we did church planting, but my heart has always been that what God laid on my heart, that the function of the leader is to raise up more men and women and bring them to a higher level as what they were before they came to that church. And I still believe that. And that is why we see churches growing and doing well. It's not because of us, it's anyhow the Lord. But we see things changing. I even told them last two weeks ago, and you must forgive me, by uh, I'm leaving anyhow tomorrow if I say the wrong thing. So uh, I even said to them, because I have no core leaders, I'm focusing on core leaders I am fathering. We are fathering them. And I think that's what we have been doing anyhow for many years. Maybe I didn't understand the fathering concept that well. Although we have always been fathered. Fathering us, uh, be a father to someone. So now I'm fathering them to make them understand. The function is not just winning souls, but winning souls bringing in children in order because automatically when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you become a child of God. But we need to go a little further. They cannot remain children. They need to become sons. Then they also need to become fathers because that's the season where we are moving into. We are, we are, that's why I believe very much we cannot remain where we have been and there was nothing wrong with the past. One thing I've learned in the past two years, not to criticize the past, not to look down at the past, because the past helped me to get where I am today. Never mind if I've made, you know, even in a ministry I failed many a time. I did many things wrong. Pastor Jim was responsible that they gave me a doctor's degree, and I don't really deserve it because I did many things which were wonderful things, great things, but that we are not always God things. It was me. It was my emotions moving and doing. And I know, I don't feel guilty about it. Praise the Lord. I did it. And we are still around. We went through issues. We went through failures. Myself, I failed many a time. But one thing I've learned, yesterday finished last night. I go on. And we need, and, and we need to move on. We need to move on. We cannot remain where we are. When Pastor Jim said this morning, and that blessed me, that give, it gave me a little more courage. When he said he's always been praying that every seat should be full. Is that correct what he said? The seat should be full. Every seat, there should be somebody in that seat. But you know, he's not the only one who has to do that. It's we. You're not here just to be a child in the church. You're not here just to enjoy church. You're not just here to receive, but go and take. You are responsible to bring in. You are responsible to transfer what is in you. We live in times where we cannot 
preach anymore what we the way we used to preach. And we used to do things, my God knows. If I listen to my own messages, I want to jump from the, from the cathedral's tower. I, I threw them all away. I burned them all. But you know what? It worked. It worked. But today we live in another time and a different generation. And I believe as I was this morning trying to figure out what I all see here, then I felt in my spirit and I said it last week and two weeks ago in Kenya, three weeks ago in Tanzania. I said, I said, this is nothing. There's going to be much more happening in the times to come because we live in a change and a time where God is going to take this thing over. And that's what I like tonight. Tonight I've been blessed. I've been blessed by two things. First of all, when I looked at the video while we were waiting to end to come in, how many children were de dedicated. I believe very strongly when you see those children, when I saw Yolandi's son, that's Henny, Pastor Henny's daughter's son, that's only a year and a half, something like that. When I saw this guy and how intellectual he already is, he can work with an with a iPad. I cannot even work. I know and know a little bit. But I see this guy switch it on, change it to games, change it to pictures, change it to color. But I realized, I realized one thing. We are responsible for the preparation of that generation which comes out of that little boy. Pastor Luke's wife is, they are expecting another, they don't know yet what it is by next month. But we need to see what's coming. Out of that child could come a generation who will do the finishing work. Who will do? Because the Bible tells us a generation yet to be born. Yet to be born. And that can you see the responsibility we have. And we are not going to preach anymore to those children. We are not going to push any more verses down their throat and make them sing choruses if we do not live the life. And we got away with those things in the past. We got away with that. But if you look to the future, we need man and woman who Elijah was singing tonight the right type of songs, which also blessed me. Because the days of just worshiping are finished. We need to start singing quality songs. Songs which uplifts God, brings God down or heaven down to earth. We are not here to go to heaven. We are here to bring heaven down to earth. To earth. Tell me, tell me quickly. No, you must be honest. Pastor Jim was very honest this morning when he said, uh, do you think I need God? And everybody said, yes. And then he said, oh, is it really that you think I need God? But you need God. No, you must be honest. How many of you, okay, want to die? Put up your hands. Who want to die? My gosh, that's not even one hand. You see, that's good, that's great, because God never planned for you to go up. God planned for you here, and you've got to get the things going with the presence of God in your life. And that's what I believe when I listen to his, 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 his words of uh, the reign of God, the God in us. And when he prayed about the presence, you know, I'm, I'm hungry in the last year. I'm hungry for the presence of God. It's no good I stand here. It's no good I try to bring a message if we cannot become aware of the presence of God. Yeah. We need the presence. We don't need more. We need him. You understand that? But you, you are the platform. You create an atmosphere. You create the atmosphere for him to be here. You. And you can only create that type of atmosphere with his presence in your life. And that's important. Now, if you forgive, forgive, forgive me, I was thinking while we were singing, I was thinking on this verse. It's not even part of my program or, or my message. Listen to this carefully. I'm not going to tell where it is written because I want you to listen. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Crying out, Abba, Father, 
Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a... Oh, only one person knows that. But a son. But a son. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Hallelujah. Say, say, say to yourself, I'm a son. I'm not a Christian, I'm a son. Okay, we are, let's call it Christians for the sake of, but I don't call myself anymore a Christian. I call myself, I'm a son. But you know, the problem is this. This is our problem. And I like Pastor Jimmy when he mentioned yesterday something or day before yesterday. We all become children. Like this little boy of one and a half years old is just a child. But it's our responsibility to see that he grows and becomes a son. Now, many of us, not here at other places, we are maybe 20 years in the church or 30 years ago we have been baptized and yet we are still children. It's time that we move on to the next level because we need sons. God needs sons. We are sons. Say to the person next to you, you are a son. And even if you are a woman, you are a son. In God, there is no gender. Hello. We are sons of God. Now start seeing yourself as son. Even if you have childish behavior, but let's start working like this morning's message. And if you, had, if you were not here, try and get the, 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 the CD or the DVD. I think it was a tremendous message. Plain, simple, down to earth. And I might close with that because it's also about prayer. But you know, the moment when you start growing, the moment when you become a, and you start seeing yourself as a son, you know what to pray and wherefore to pray. And like the very first point this morning, it was about wisdom. It's not about give me, give me, give me. God is not Walmart. <laughs> wisdom. But anyhow, what I wanted to share with you, and if, forgive me, I was, this is a letter I wrote to my sons. Let's call it to the leaders in Africa. Listen to this. The Lord has awakened us to who we are and why we are who we are. He has a purpose for each of us to fulfill his purpose on earth. God wants us to understand that our destiny is to become the many fasted sons of the kingdom. In other words, God has a purpose. We'll get to that just now. Now listen to this. That's how God revealed it to me and I wrote it. I believe we are standing in the most significant time in the history of creation. I believe we are standing on the brink of greater things even in this church. Things are going to happen like never before. Many things happened. Great things have happened. This, this place is there because something happens. If you look to, this, to the figures, it's because it happened. But guess what? More is going to happen. Just more. You take this from me. Because when God is in it, it's going to happen. I believe we are standing in the most significant time in the history of creation. We are in an hour of transition. Time of change. Change means, means moving on. Hearing what God says. Doing what God says. Hello? You see, I, thank God, this comes now to my mind. I'm finished just a teaching. And maybe I'm going to teach it somewhere I have in mind. A teaching about we traditional, me, I, want to, I was a traditional Pentecostal. We always spoke about faith, faith. Faith. You don't have enough faith. You need to pray for more faith. Faith. Faith here, faith there. But it's not about faith. It's number one, obedience. Obey. Obey God. Obeying, doing, doing. Be disciplined and doing. Then, it, then your faith starts growing. The more obedient you are, the more faith. So we are not going to talk about each of them. Just say faith. Yes, without faith we can't do it. God himself is faith. But from faith, we go to anointing. You know, anointing has nothing to do with performing and jumping. Anointing is God makes you able to do that what he planned for you in your life. 
God gives you the ability. I can talk for an hour about anointing. But the one, if on obedience you flow into faith, faith starts growing. The more faith and the more you do one and two, the more anointing you will have. And we need that anointing. And many people right there stop at anointing. But from anointing, if that starts growing and becomes more, it jumps into glory. This tree where that was me. So it's my, through, due to me, me listening, me doing, me increasing faith, etc. Anointing, operating, God's operating through these three things. But when it comes glory, he's doing that. It becomes him. Remember that. Now listen to this. I wrote it and I felt this tonight. I need to tell you this. We are entering into a new order in the kingdom of God. A day is coming and it is the next major event in God's program of the ages. When all the glories of the son of God will be revealed and manifested in the sons of God. In other words. The glory will increase. The presence of God. In other words, that's glory. Presence. If we talk about Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, 28, we see he created, he made man. He did not first say multiply. No, no. He said first be fruitful and multiply. It's not it's first fruitful and multiply. Yes, his image is the glory of God. We are not just here to multiply. We are here to transmit his glory, his presence. I think we got away with many things in the past. We used to work on people's emotions. We used to make, force people make decisions based on what I, you know, you know that, that's what I also did. But when we look to, to the future, then we'll see it cannot, will not be done anymore. There's a new kind of people. They need to see God. They need to experience his presence in your life. They need to see and read on your face his glory, his presence. A new reality is being formed in the elect of God in this hour, which shall spread all over all creation. God is creating something new. A new history is beginning. A new world is coming to the earth. The earth shall be filled with the glory of God. Nothing is going to stop it. Nothing. So when God says, when God says, God is raising up a people and through the sons of God, he's putting a seed into the earth. We are the new seed of, for the new age. God's purpose in raising up Christ in us. That through us, the generations of mankind may be lifted out of the curse of sin and death. Lifted toward revelation and eternal life and glory. In my heart, I believe that's the answer. If we want to do something effectively for his kingdom, it has to live in me. We cannot just be satisfied by going to church as we have heard. Yes, we are part of a body. You cannot operate without God. God's intention was not a denomination. God's intention was a family. We are family. We belong to this household. We are part of this household. And therefore, we need to work as a household. We need to come together. We need to cry together, pray together, rejoice together. Together we move out. Because, hey, if you have received a message, like some of these messages I heard uh, Pastor Luke brought on Wednesday evening and this morning, hey, we cannot just say, it was a good message. That means nothing. Impl implementation without application does not work. We need to take those messages. And we need to go and chew on those messages. We need to rethink, maybe re-listen, discuss with others that this message becomes a reality. Otherwise, it means nothing. I'm busy with a total new teaching, and I will send it to Pastor Deborah. She can, she can help me fix it if I did it wrong. And this teaching, I call. Let me let me get it here. I call this teaching from revival to resurrection power. From revival to resurrection power, which means your position in Christ. It's no many people want revival, but they never get revived. Many people want to attend revival meetings, and then when they get goosebumps, they say, That's God. God does not work through goosebumps. Hello? Many want this. This is so wonderful. They all get kicked, and nobody gets started. Hello? And when we go home, we say, wow, 
That was a good message. That was fantastic. That was wonderful. And if you ask them, what, what did they say? Oh, that was so wonderful. It was too wonderful. Listen, it's time. It's time that we come and we must, must start listening. Because the power does not lie in reading books. There's, there, the power doesn't lie and go for extra classes and special certificates. It does not lie in listening to a tape. It's hearing. The power is in the hearing. When the word is spoken, we need to hear that word. We'll come back to that one. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> May I read some of the verses? I, I don't know if we are going to get there. But can we go together? Don't open the Bible. I want you to read with me Matthew 5, verse 13 in the message. Is that honey? Is it there? Okay, are you ready? All together. One, two, three. Let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out God flavors in this earth. Number two, number 14. One, two, three. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You have lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Number 14. Keep on. One, two, three. Here's another way to put it. You are here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a seeker to be kept. We are going public with this as public as a city on the hill. Hallelujah. Next verse. Look at the next one. If, we, if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting on the light stand. <laughs> Hallelujah. But some of us are in a hiding place. It's time to get out of the hiding place. It's no good to say in your bedroom, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Maybe you must stop saying anything, but start living the life. Next one. Now that I've put you on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine, say shine. shine. Well, you better start shining on your faces. Estee Lauder is not going to help it. Or the other creams everybody puts on. It's still a mask. Hey. We need a natural smile, a true smile, the glory coming from your face. Hallelujah. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Next one. By opening up to others, you will prompt people to open up with God. Wow. Oh, stop right the bus. Isn't that true? When opening up to others, we've heard it this morning, I think, or in the singing. It's about love. God, God has never stopped loving me. Even when I failed, he was there. He didn't run away. He was there. Powerful, man. He doesn't give up on you. Don't you give up on God. Don't mess with God. That's on the back of the bumper of the car I'm driving. Okay. <laughs> Completing God's law. Next one. Don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. Next, I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together, pull it all together in a fast panorama. Next one, I think that's the key. You know, if you look at these four verses, and I think you need to read them again at home and think about, go to the next one, Ephesians 1.11. I think we've got that one. Are you ready for reading that one? And if you are here tonight and you don't know Jesus, many, many have come to, to the front and many say they have been saved, but they don't know the Lord Jesus. You know, hey, if you are here and you are not sure of your salvation, then you're at the best place tonight. Hello? Because there's the key. Are you ready to read that one? One, two, three. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had an eye on us, had designs on us. For what? It's not about that we can prosper. Prospering 
prosperity has nothing to do with money. It's a spirit. God wants us to prosper in Africa. People have no money, but they prosper. Hello? You see, you can have five Mercedes Benz and a house with a swimming pool at the top and yet not prosper. You can have nothing. A couple of dollars in the bank and you struggle. You can prosper. I love that one. It's in Christ. Nowhere else can we get that assurance. Now listen to this. And this is, the, this is what I speak lately very much about. We live in a season where God is revealing himself in such a tremendous way as never before. I believe that we are going to experience God. Yes. It's no good we come together and we have a nice time. It's not about the nice time. It's about getting into the presence of God. But you have to bring him in. That's what we want. We want, like he was singing, say, I love it what they sang tonight. It's, and it's also wonderful to sing, it's well with my soul. Then while you sing it, you really start examining yourself. Yes, he's preparing a generation who will take, who will do the finishing work. But listen to this. In, in Numeri 14, verse 21, God used to say, he said, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. Shall be. And then he says, and that's not on the board, Isaiah, and Isaiah 14, verse 24 to 26. Who can change this? Who can stop me doing that? What I have decided will be like that. So the glory of God has to spread. The answer doesn't lie in the politicians. The answer doesn't lie in the dollars. The answer doesn't lie in the EU. The answer for America is here. We, nobody else, nobody else. Even it looks bad, even the corruption is on the top. It's not about AIDS, it's not about, it's not about the gays and abortion. It's about me getting right. So that I can be that instrument who will bring forth change. So and I can only do that when it is in me. I said just yesterday, if you know someone who loves God and he's like, he operates like a leader or a father, stay close to them because I believe walking next to a grace carrier. Stay close to people who release grace. Hello? Only one amen. It's okay. But you know what? Yes, these things are going to happen. I believe we are standing on a brink to see something. Yeah. Listen, listen. I've also learned in the past few years that God doesn't need 20,000. Hello? He needs just a few who are willing. Even in this church, we are many. But hey, that's wonderful. But isn't that necessary that we get a remnant, the remnant operating who will help those people to get what they have? But that, may, that, need, that needs a lifestyle. Because when you live in the full righteousness and you walk in the statues and the, and the kingdom principles and the kingdom laws, you draw people. People want what you have got. Now, if you take these verses, I want to read actually to you Matthew 24, verse 14. I have two minutes left. Can you believe it? Are you there? Okay, I'm reading it. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it. Then, finally, the end will come. We are not here to run away. We are not here for an escape mechanism. We have a responsibility to do that, what God wants to be done. I like Pastor Jim. He said also this morning, no, I can also sit like him. And you know when is Jesus coming? Don't think about all the problems we experience and the mountains who have spit fire and uh, all the tsunamis. Forget about that. The only sign when Jesus comes, there's enough scripture in it, is when this world has made the footstool for his feet. So what does that say? Uh, you, you, can celebrate, you can say, oh, Jesus must come. I want to run away. And he's coming at the end of this year. No, forget about it. Matthew, of Matthew 22, verse 44. Hebrews 10, verse 13. When this world 
has made a footstool for his feet. So, what do we need to understand? First of all, there's a reason for your existence. There's a reason why he created you. And my slogan in the last two years is, while purpose is why you were born, I think it's there, while purpose is why you were born, vision is when you start seeing it yourself. We need to understand why we are here. Hello? Why? Why were you? Now, I believe, I'm, and I'm, they need to correct me if I'm wrong, but if I listen this morning and what I've been hearing, we all believe that even before you were created, God knew you. I believe that God created this world. And, and the sixth day, only in the last part of the sixth day, the second part of the last part, he created, he made man. So that man could have everything and enjoy everything he created. But I feel that he knew something is going to be wrong. And that is why he planned for his coming. His coming was at hand already. When you study the Old Testament, we, it is all uh, uh, telling us about his coming. So what we are saying is, we are not here by accident. We are not here because my father and my mother slept together. We are not here because the Sunday afternoon didn't turn out very well because another baby was made. And that baby is not an accident. God's plan for it. And we need to understand that. Why are we here? Never mind if we've even heard it this morning. Even if we struggle. Even if we have all these things we experience in this life. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit took him in the wilderness. But in the wilderness is where he was tempted. When you are not reading the word, when you are not studying the word, when you are not living according to the word, you will be tempted. But while you are in the wilderness, he's feeding us. He's looking after us. And now I need to finish. But uh, I'm not even halfway. May I just say one more thing? Can you put that one thing up? Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. Listen to this. Christ in us, the hope of glory. God. The mystery in a nutshell is just this. Read it. Christ is in you. Therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of our message. When you take that verse, and when you take the A part and the B part, you know what I saw? It's something I only learned just recently. In you. So when he's in you, he becomes the catalyst. The catalyst, I don't know if I pronounce it properly, but it's the one who makes you able, who provokes, who's the agent that provokes significant change. We cannot change people if there is nothing in us. We need the fullness of his glory. Yes, so what I'm saying, the word glory means the supremacy of Christ, power and authority. Number two, the attributes of Christ. Yes, the characteristic, the assets of Christ. Yes, Christ needs to be formed. And then the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4 verse 19, Do you know how I feel right now and will feel until Christ's lives become visible in your lives? The Amplified Bible speaks about formed, molded in you until Christ becomes visible. Brothers and sisters, we are his children. Never mind if you are still sucking a dummy. Or on the bottle. That's fine. You are there. But let's move on. That's, we need to move on. We need to grow. If we want to make a change like this church has always been doing. This church has never been catering for the people inside the church. But also for the people outside the church. And that's important. We are here to make the difference. We are here not just to... To preach the gospel but to make a difference when people see you make a difference when you drive when you sit on the train when you sit on the bus when you arrive at the work and you walk in the office the people must immediately experience something is happening the presence of god is moving in now i'm finally closing 
Sorry, forgive me, but I need to say, you know, we are not religious, but we are spiritual. Are you happy with that one? We are spiritual people. Because religious people, religious, you know, religious, religion focuses on heaven. Kingdom focuses on earth. Yes, we go to God for sure if we go. That's what Pastor Jim always Religion reaches up to God. The kingdom is God coming down to man. Religion wants to escape. Yes, religion is man's effort to impress God. So how do we, how do we, how do we? And then now I close Jim. Okay, here's it. I'm closing. How do, we, how do we increase in that glory? How do we get through, through these four stages of obedience, faith, anointing, glory? Simple. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. There are four points. Number one, there it is. And they continually steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of the bread and prayers. Number one, we need to get back to the word. Get back to the word, correct? Number one, word, 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 word. So get, take your time, read the word, study the word, let it go through you, try to hear what he is saying. You know, we need, we, not, not, we also need revelation. There's a proceeding and a preceding word. The word, people, people die, people fail because they do not read the word. Number two, we need fellowship. We need fellowship. The fellowship, when you read word, when you are full of the word, you in his interest. His presence starts increasing, but then you want to share it with others. Come together, share the word, share the word. Number three, they came together. That was the power of the very first year. Table of the Lord, communion, breaking bread, eating together, but also breaking bread. It's nothing wrong. And breaking bread a couple of times a day. We'll talk about that. I later said, lastly, is prayer. Why is prayer number four? You have been listening this morning to prayer. That was fantastic. I even learned again. I taught people 30 years ago how to pray. I used the Lord's prayer. But why is it number four? You see, if you study the word and you live according to the word and you, you have fellowship with, with the believers and with others and you break bread, you know how to pray. You know how to pray. You know how to pray. And that's what we've heard. You don't need to make a big study. But if you do that, if you start living in these four points, start seeing God's plans and God's purposes for you. He did that already before you were created and made. Thank you. Isn't God good? Just want to take a moment. Make sure before we leave tonight that everybody's right with God. Is that all right? I don't want you to leave here. Walk into the parking lot. Your heart stops and you die and you go to hell. I want you to leave here and I want you to live a glorious and victorious life. But you've got to be right with God before anything else. And I want to make sure before we leave tonight, we've sung songs, we heard a great word from Carl. We got to know Carl again and again and how excited it is for many of you, you've never met Carl before, even though he's been around for a long time. We see why he is successful as an apostolic ministry all over the world and especially in Africa. But how sad it would be to walk out of this place and not be right with God. God wants you to know he loves you. That he loved you so much that he came to this planet when he didn't have to, beaten bloody to a pulp, nailed to the cross, raised from that dead on that, from that tomb, raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father just for you because he wants you to have a better life. And I want to make sure tonight that you're not going to go to hell, that you're going to go to heaven. Jesus gives us insight. He tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man goes to the Father except by him. You can't get there my way. You can't get to heaven your way. You cannot get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. So many times we have our own concept of how we're going to get to heaven. We say to ourselves, I think I'm okay. 
There's nowhere in the Bible does it say positive thinking is going to get you to heaven. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. So many times we'll say, I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. Nowhere in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. You could say, wait a minute, Lord, you don't understand. I, I really love God a lot. I, I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God, you get to go to heaven. In fact, if you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to get there, like I said earlier, Jesus' way. And he tells us exactly that way. Now listen closely. In John, the third chapter, he tells you exactly how to get to heaven. I'll share it with you in just a moment. Some of you think you're going to get to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian when you were a kid. Had you christened or baptized when you were a baby. Took you to catechism classes or Sunday school or Sabbath school classes when you were a child. Can I tell you that nowhere in the Bible does that say that will get you to heaven? Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. And if you're relying on that to make you a Christian, you're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. The way to get to heaven is Jesus' way. And Jesus said these words in John, the third chapter, you must be born again. You must be born again. When I use the words born again, immediately people turn off in American churches. They say immediately, I don't want any part of that. You know why? Because you've been trained by Hollywood, movies and magazines to think of born again people as crazy, as goofy, fanatical and radical people. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. What Jesus is talking about when he said born again is simply you giving God all of your heart and you giving God all of your life. Listen closely. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, what God's after in your life is all of your heart and all of your life. When Jesus came to this planet, what did he give you? All of his heart and all of his life. And he's looking for a people that will respond back to him and give God all of your heart and all of your life. That's what it means to be born again, that you give God all of your heart and all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be, all or nothing. I'll prove it to you, last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. You've heard of the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking, he says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? People that are lukewarm, that call themselves Christians, are not real Christians at all. And you're not going to make it. You're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. What's lukewarm? Let's get on the same page. Let's define it for you. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, a token prayer, occasional church attendance. Lukewarm, you're not against God. Watch this. No, no, you're not against against God, but you're not wholehearted for God, that's lukewarm. And may I say something to you? God is something in your life, but he's not everything. That's lukewarm. He'll never be something until you make him everything. And it's your call and it's your choice. And that's what we mean about being born again, giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life, an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you might say to me, you say, well, Pastor Jim, hold on just a minute. How do I do that? How do I give God all of my heart? How do I give God all, all of my life? Well, let's do it God's way. Let's don't do it yours or mine or some other way, but let's do it God's way. Jesus said, here's what he said. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. Let me say it again. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you before my Father. So tonight is your appointment with God. You have a divine, godly that means, appointment with God. Tonight is your night of salvation where you give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Being born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. You don't want to go to hell. You want to go to heaven. And you know it. 
And you're going to have to do something about it. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give it to him. You know why? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not going to steal your heart, your life. It belongs to you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. It's got to be your call to give God what you have, which is your heart and your life. It's your choice, not mine. It's yours. And tonight in this safe, friendly place, we have laughed, we have sung songs. You heard a great inspirational message from a great man of God, an apostolic man of God. Tonight, and we're going to be dismissed in just a few minutes. And you don't want to miss this opportunity, this divine appointment that you have with God. You've had a lot of appointments in your life. You've had appointments with doctors and plumbers and painters and attorneys. But now you have a divine appointment with God. God brought you here to get right with him. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Well, let's give God all of our heart, all of our life. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one. Two, three, and then I'm going to pound on this platform. It'll sound like this. I'll go one, two, three, and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up all over this auditorium. I'll see your hand go up. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I don't want to just know him in my head because I already know you know who he is. I already know you celebrate Christmas and Easter every year, but that won't get you to heaven, nor does it make you a Christian because it's not about what you have in your head. Even the devil knows who he is. He's not going to heaven. So it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you're going to do with your heart. And when you hear this sound, bang, your hand goes up and I'll see it. And what you're saying is I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. Tonight is your night of salvation. Don't just sit there and do nothing. Get ready to put your hand up. Who should put their hand up? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, and if you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, then make sure. You know, you're saying to yourself, I wonder if I've really done this. I wonder if I've done it. I wonder if I'm right. Then make sure, get right with God. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham on television. Maybe you prayed at a harvest crusade. Hey, that's great. But did you give God all of your heart? Or did you just follow a magical abracadabra verbal formula that you spoke and called it a prayer? God's not stupid. He says, well, they just prayed the right prayer. I'm going to let them in heaven. God watches your life that follows your heart to see if the prayer is real. So don't mess with God. Don't treat him like he's an idiot. He knows whether or not you've given him all of your heart and given him all of your life. And somebody needs to tell you the truth that loves you enough. And tonight is your night. Sit there and do nothing. And it's your call. Or get ready to put your hand up. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. If I put my hand up, I'll be embarrassed. I'll feel funny. The people I came with will feel, will see me. The people behind me will see me. Yep, you can feel embarrassed for a moment, but it's better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this than to go to hell. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. I'm going to pound on this platform, and you're going to either get your hand up or not get your hand up. It's your call. If you've never given him all of your heart, and if you've never given him all of your life, or you need to re-give it to him because you haven't really followed through with your commitment, then tonight is your night. Are you ready? I'm counting to three. Here it is. One, two, Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Back over here. There's eight. Back over here. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. There's eight wise people. Anybody else? There's nine. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else that needs to get their hand up tonight? This is your night of salvation. Anybody else? There's eight or nine wise people already. Anybody else? Anybody else? You're sitting there saying, I wonder if you Thank you. I think I already got them, but I'll count them as 10. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? I already... Uh, how many? One? Oh, two. Okay, 10. I think I already got one over there, so that's 11. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11 wise people. Here's what we want you to do. All 11 of you, if you raised your hand, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, 
your friend, get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. If you raised your hand and you're serious about God, or if you didn't raise your hand but you know you should have, then get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. I don't want anybody to leave the room. That would be rude. But let's let the people come. So let's stand and welcome them as they come. If you raised your hand or if you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. your day of salvation. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to die and go to hell. You're going to get to go to heaven. Hey, that's good. <laughs> All right. I want you to look right over here. This is Dr. B. Dr. B is Dr. Becker, and he's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to him so that you need to invite Jesus into your heart. He'll help you to do that. Is that okay? Number two, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature, stuff you can take home. Now that you're a Christian, what does God want you to do? Just read about it. It's as simple as that. Third grade reading level. And third, he's going to encourage you to get back to church, get a spiritual personal trainer, someone to help you with God and help you to pray with you and meet you before church service. We give away friends here. So get yourself a spiritual personal trainer that will help you in the next few weeks so you don't go back falling through the cracks, getting down and depressed and discouraged and bummed out and not going on with God. God wants to do something in your life, but you're going to have to do something first. And that, gets mean, and that means getting close to him. Only takes a few minutes. People you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Dr. Becker right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. 